Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, remembering the Alamo, or better yet, forgetting it, our guest, Brian Burrow, is a special correspondent for Vanity Fair and the author of seven books, including the New York Times number one best-selling Barbarians at the Gate with John Hellyar and Public Enemies. He is co-author of a terrific new book called Forget the Alamo. Brian Burrow, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, thank you for coming on. This is a fantastic book. One of the books I've enjoyed the most in recent years. Forget the Alamo, I think, because I love anything that makes war propaganda seem ridiculously, absurdly uh, dumb. I don't know if that's how you see the book, but that's one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much. Uh, what, what do people basically think happened at the Alamo and what actually happened? Well, the, the, the traditional narrative, if you will, is of uh, a group of American colonists going down to the northern Mexico province of Texas uh, and settling in uh, the 1820s and by the mid-1830s be realizing, believing that they have been oppressed and that they are losing their freedom to the dastardly Mexican dictator Santa Ana, at which point they decide to fight for their freedom uh, a number of them gather at an old Spanish mission called the Alamo in San Antonio, where they are engulfed, overwhelmed, and killed by an invading uh, Mexican army under Santa Ana. But the last part of the myth has always been that they, they held up the army long enough that uh, the great Sam Houston uh, was able to raise an army of his own and subsequently defeat Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto. What really happened? What really happened is the American colonists we're not only not oppressed, we're not only not take, having their freedom taken away, they actually had more rights than any other Mexican citizen in that they alone were allowed to uh, hold slaves, which was um, a potent and fervent point of contention between the central governor, which was abolitionist, and the Texas colonists, who by and large had come to Texas to farm, um, to farm cotton. So we argue and forget the Alamo that the Texas revolt was a lot more about slavery than it was about anyone's freedom, much less oppression. And that's before we even begin to get into the myths of the battle itself, chief among them being the famous uh, legend many of you, many people might have heard of, you know, Colonel Travis, the commander, draw, drawing that line in the sand with his sword, and all ye who want to fight for freedom step across, which, of course, never happened and was, um, was constructed by an Alamo enthusiast a good 50 years later. <laughs> We're supposed to think that every single person in that fort who died chose consciously, intentionally chose to die fighting, whereas in reality they tried to surrender. Some of them did surrender. Some of them tried to flee. Uh, they didn't all choose to die, correct? That, that was the point of the, the line in the sand myth, is Texans, especially years later, needed desperately to believe that this military disaster, you know, a, a clear blunder, had been for a reason, had been to further something. And so they came up with these ideas that, that yeah, the, the, the defenders, the 200 or so defenders were there uh, by choice. In fact, they were there and caught and fought to their deaths because they, they ignored every warning of Santa Ana's army on its way. They ignored these warnings in large part because the scouts that they were using were Mexican-American and most of them were fervent Southern racists uh, who just didn't believe that an army could be on its way. Did they fight bravely? No doubt, as men do when people are trying to kill them. Did they fight at their posts and, and you know, and, and uh, uh, to the death to defend the Alamo? No, we know now from Mexican accounts that as many as 40% of them actually broke and ran and were run down in the open by Mexican lancers. Um, we also know now uh, from Mexican accounts that um, Travis, the commander, tried to surrender not once but twice, and uh, Santa Ana, who uh, was you know, not the nicest fellow in the world, but not exactly some vicious dictator by this point, um, uh, dismissed his, his offers for surrender. He wanted them uh, made an example of. 
the one of the most famous, um, almost mythological figures who died there was a guy named Davy Crockett. I don't know if uh, Charlie Crockett on the shirt you're wearing is any relation, but uh, but uh, Davy Crockett for some period of time in historical accounts, it was very important to stress that he surrendered because this showed the barbarity of the Mexicans who killed people who surrendered. Then it became uh, respectable and, and, and obligatory to pretend that he didn't surrender surrender uh, how, you know, how do you how do you change uh, the required story like that history changes all the time David as, as, as you know interpretations of it change all the time you know Crockett was fairly famous in his day he was a 49 year old fleshy former Tennessee congressman who had been voted out of office and was looking for a new start hoped to find it perhaps getting political office in Texas so he enrolled in the army as you do as you did at the time to get some land and to be, be eligible for, for, uh, for office. Um, uh, Mexican accounts now we know today, almost certainly, we have multiple Mexican accounts that Crockett was among the few who surrendered and was executed, as was reported, as you say, widely in the 1830s in the wake of the Alamos fall. Um, for a long time, that was accepted fact. And then 100 years go by, in the 1950s, the Walt Disney Company company makes a series of Davy Crockett movies, the last of which ends at the Alamo. Um, and this changed the whole image of Crockett, the historical Cro Crockett and the Crockett of your mind. It's only that Crockett became a symbol of American heroism, a symbol of uh, anti-communism really in the 50s, such that by the end of the 50s, when you begin to see a bunch of new Alamo books, they're all a little wary now about saying that Davy uh, surrendered so that when it was proven without a doubt by a definitive me uh, Mexican account in the 1970s, it was just a massive um, controversy, at least in Texas. Of course, this is the type of Texas controversy that people outside the state are often scratching their heads going, what's that about? Well, Davy Crockett remains today one of the holy trinity of Alamo defenders, along with Jim Bowie and William Barrett Travis. So the, the controversy over how Crockett died, which erupted in the 70s, really was in some ways the birth, at least in the mainstream press, of this whole notion of um, Texas and Alamo revisionism, the idea that these incredibly important to, to, to Texas and to Texas culture and to Texas identity, these incredibly important stories might not be as written stone as they always seem to be, that they that, – that, and, and it thus began an effort, which we continue in Forget the Alamo, to try to reclaim the historical Alamo, the actual Alamo, rather than the more fanciful Alamo of legend that has persisted all these decades. I, I was struck also in reading the book about how, uh, you know, there were Latino, Hispanic participants in this uh, catastrophe, this blunder, this tragedy, uh, and they're sort of written out of the story, and you're supposed to imagine it was all white U.S. Northern people, and, uh, and, and so it's a point of pride for Latinos, at least until recent days, we must insist that we had people as part of this gigantic blunder as well. Uh, and the number of accounts you have of, of young people growing up in Texas and their first real encounter with, with bigotry uh, is being told, your people killed Davy Crockett, uh, right. almost like accusing Jews of killing Jesus Christ. I mean, this this sacred and, and important, whereas Davy Crockett is not exactly a model human being to, uh, to be deifying. No, it's, it's really a tragic story in that uh, Mexican-Americans living in Texas at the time who were called Tejanos were the allies of um, the business partners and allies of the American colonists during peacetime and their allies uh, during war. They were scouts and soldiers, and a number of them died at the Alamo. And afterwards, they, their, their reward was to graduate into a Texas Republican, a, te a Texas Republic, a Texas society of grinding uh, racism in which uh, the Tejanos were marginalized. Uh, many of them were, their land and their livestocks were forcibly taken by incoming whites. Um, and they were subsequently, as you referenced, all but entirely written out of um, uh, the Texas history that's taught in schools. Um, and it really wasn't until the 60s and 70s that the first new Chicano scholars, Latino scholars, began revisiting these stories and attempting to resuscitate the importance of Tejano's uh, then and now. And 
I will say um, we we are keenly aware that as three uh, middle-aged white guys, we're not the ideal messengers for this. Um, but frankly, nobody else was out there saying it, and we felt like we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't highlight the role and the diminution of the, the Tejanos in Texas history. Um, I will say that I have an awful lot of new Tejano friends now, which I um, am very happy for because I had no idea, David, you know, I was a 58-year-old Anglo who had no idea about the myths of the Alamo. I accepted them, but about the effect that they had on Tejanos, the way generations of Tejanos have felt that the traditional uh, creation myth of Texas, the, the Alamo story, has been, used and, has been used, and I don't use this word lightly, to oppress them, um, you know, by making them feel like the Texas Revolution was all Anglos versus all Mexicans, and you know the the the, the message that generations of Tejanos have gotten is, um, you kill Davy Crockett, you can't be American. And we quote an awful lot of Tejanos, Latinos in in the book talking about how harmful this has been to their ethnic identity, and we think that 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 makes this more than just about history. This is really about. Uh, Texas culture, about Tejano culture. And it's particularly important because Tejanos are, uh, Latinos are about to become any year now uh, a majority in Texas, where Anglos are, are only 41%. So it has um, a newfound relevance. Uh, yet it, it would be nice if the if the the, the goal were not just to uh, persuade everyone uh, of the fact that Tejanos were part of the Alamo, but also of what actually happened at the Alamo and the dubiousness of it as a as a point of pride. Um, it, it seems it seems that the the propaganda around the Alamo got started very early, right? I mean, there was a there was another larger slaughter of of Texas troops at a place called Goliad that uh, I'm guessing almost nobody has ever heard of that didn't be well, become... outside of Texas. You haven't heard of Goliad and there are reasons, but you're right. Ha look, half the book is the history and half is really the historiography, the story of the story, if you will, how it arose and how it developed over year over this years into this overwhelming and it widely beloved in Texas, I should say, um, but an, Anglo, uh, uh, an overwhelming Anglo-centric narrative. You're right. It happens literally within hours of the fight. Within hours of the fight, the heads of the two armies, both Santa Ana and Sam Houston for the Texans, realize that they've got a problem on their hands. Uh, Sam Houston is deathly afraid that Texans will panic, as in fact many did and began fleeing toward Louisiana and that he won't be able to even raise an army um, if the story of the Alamo gets out without the proper, the proper spin, if you will. Santa Ana, of, of course, made sure he had some survivors, uh, a slave and uh, an American woman, and sent them out with the message to spread just that message, to spread panic. And at least initially, it was, um, uh, it was successful. People did begin panicking and fleeing. But Houston quickly, and you have to give him credit for this militarily, grabbed the slave Joe, grabbed this woman, and kind of massaged their stories. You know, the, initially they were saying things like uh, the commander of the Alamo, Travis, committed suicide, things like that. Uh, Houston had his officers round these folks up and kind of massaged their story into a, a, one of, of heroism. How, you know, how these people had fought the dastardly brown hordes. Uh, uh, for liberty and all this, and got it immediately into a Texas newspaper where it was quickly picked up within weeks um, throughout American newspapers, which rallied to the Texans' defense. But most importantly, the, the kind of the weaponization of, of this propaganda by Houston really was, I think, the primary reason that the Texans were subsequently six weeks after the Alamo able to win at the Battle of San Jacinto. I think as much as guns and sabers, it was um, the incredible spirit, the uh, the morale of the Texians, uh, the troops there, um, how they too believed that they were fighting their lives, fighting for their lives. And, you know, it's no accident that as they charged across that field at San Jacinto toward um, the mostly dozing Mexican army, you know, you heard the first shouts uh, of Remember the Alamo. Uh, 
you point out, well, why weren't we remembering Goliad as well, where, what, twice as many Texans were killed? There were shouts that day of remember Goliad, but Goliad has always kind of been the avis of Texas battles, um, in large part because all of them uh, were killed with little uh, communication. The main reason of all the reasons that the Alamo has gone down in lore, um, that it was famous in 1836 and it'll be famous in 2036, were these incredibly eloquent letters that the commander, Travis, uh, mailed out to the provisional governor, to a- anyone and everybody who might send him reinforcements. Um, they are just beautiful letters uh, that, you know, that, that, that reference and, and, and virtue, ch- virtue signal the American Revolution and how great Americans are fighting against these mongrel hordes of Mexicans. And they made um, Travis and everyone at the Alamo into a martyr the way those who died at Goliad never were widely recognized. Yet they weren't terribly successful, Brian Burrow, in terms of getting uh, major numbers of recruitments, right? No, I think they got, what, 31 guys showed up from Gonzalez, I think it was, the one, the one group that came in that brought their numbers up. The exact numbers are always in debate. The exact numbers seem to be around 180. Uh, and, of course, they, and Santa Ana was sitting around them with 6,000. So, you know, it was pretty clear from the word go that the Texans had no choice. I mean, it's hard, it is not labeling them cowards to, to acknowledge that Travis offered to surrender. Who wouldn't have, you know? It is not labeling anyone coward to say they broke and run when, you know, 4,000 of the defenders, you know, come over the walls and are killing everyone around them. What, you know, I mean, what would you do? Um, nevertheless, there are those today, Alamo traditionalists, we call them, who believe that any disruption in the historic, in the legend, any questioning of the reasons for the revolt, the facts, the facts of the battle make you some woke lefty, you know, who wants to, you know, destroy Texas, which is kind of how we've been painted in certain very conservative quarters. Can I just tell you without going into my voting record that I'm about the furthest thing from some woke lefty that you could, you know, ever want to find? To me, the beauty of this was just that it was an historical record, an historical curiosity, history that seemed just got just there to be corrected. And I should also say as a as a very quick tangent, this is, you know, much of what we write in uh, Forget the Alamo, I'm proud to say is original but even more really amounts to a summation of academic scholarship over the last 30 or 40 years. We're real, what we, the, 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 the picture that we present in Forget the Alamo, from the emphasis on slavery to um, ways that the historical record really doesn't support the traditional uh, accounts of the battle, has really been pioneered by academics. And we, we stand on their shoulders and make that very clear in, in the book. It is a wonderful book, Forget the Alamo, by by Brian Burrow and his co-authors. I highly recommend it. Um, I'm I'm struck by the fact that that people think of the people in the Alamo as having been Americans, as having been part of the United States, when in fact uh, they weren't. They weren't even an independent nation of Texas. They were part of Mexico, right? Texas was a part of – I mean, even less than, than Pearl Harbor was it – part of the United States, uh, and their objection was to Mexico daring to enforce Mexican laws, in particular a law against slavery, right? And you you quote in the book that, that the Texans warned each other the soldiers were coming to, quote, to give liberty to our slaves and to make slaves of ourselves, uh, which as far as I can tell meant to end actual enslavement of anybody and to require that we abide by laws and pay taxes. Right. There, we, we argue in the book that there are essentially two ways to view any revolt. And this was, a, this was not some political revolution, let's be clear. This was a secessionist revolt. And there's two ways to view it, right? The underlying cause, the thing that got people so worked up and angry at each other, um, we argue that that was slavery. And we think that that's the more important reason. If you don't believe the underlying reason is important, you end up believing the American Revolution was about tea. Um, The trigger to it, the thing that actually got people to to, to draw that first gun was, and here's an example of how 
kind of easy the Texans had it for a while. Santa Ana, to placate them, not only uh, was uh, allowing slavery, but had given them a two-year tax amnesty. And the trigger to the revolt came when Santa Ana uh, had the temerity to actually try to collect taxes, at which point Travis, the ubiquitous Travis, um, uh, you know, stormed a Mexican military ga- uh, garrison, took him uh, hostage, and a, Mex- uh, a you know a Mexican uh, army, a Mexican battalion, uh, entered Texas to try to bring him to justice. And the amazing thing is, for all the Texans, and there were many who said, "This Travis guy is nuts. He's way out over his skis. What is he doing?" The moment the Mexican army comes in, the first Mexican army. Um, it, it's it, everyone around, everyone in Texas rallies um, to to uh, Travis's defense, and that's really what began uh, the revolt. Several years after this is when Texas becomes a nation, right? And and I was struck by your comment in the book that the Texas Constitution was the only constitution we've seen on earth to guarantee slavery. We think of constitutions as guaranteeing freedoms. Is is that right? Yeah, it was our, it's our judgment when you look around. We couldn't find a more militantly pro-slavery constitution in world history, uh, e- e- far more so than, than the Confederacy. The Confederacy, actually, you could be a free black. If you were of color, if you were bl- if black in Texas, if you, were, if, if you were shipwrecked on the Texas coast, you were immediately ipso facto a slave. There was no such thing as free blacks in the nine or ten year uh, history of the of the Republic of Texas, or if they were, they were not legal. Um, so, yeah, it's difficult to say that those who were fighting the revolt uh, were not. For, I mean, they were fighting for what became the most militant uh, pro slavery republic we think the world has ever known. I mean, maybe there was something back in you know pre Roman days, but in terms of modern countries, we couldn't find anything to compare. Uh, Brian Burrow, as you note, the, this book, Forget the Alamo, looks not just at what happened and what we were told happened, but at how the stories developed over the years. And f- remember, the Alamo was was part of the Mexican-American War, was even part of the Cold War, among other wars. Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson has a role here, Walt Disney, George W. Bush. Who's who's responsible for, for creating the mythology? Well, the, the mythology, of course, was created by white Texans. Uh, but for about 100 years, um, I'd say that it remained mostly a regional thing, a Texas thing. If you lived in New York, yeah, you probably heard of the Alamo, but you didn't know much about it. What changed everything were these, uh, the trio of uh, Davy Crockett movies that Walt Disney made that were hugely popular. You know, they went viral before viral was even used back in the 50s. Uh, followed shortly thereafter by John Wayne's movie, The Alamo, which was um, a commercial disappointment, probably a creative disappointment. It's not much of a movie, but nevertheless, its portrayal of the Holy Trinity of, of Alamo defenders, its portrayal of, of, you know, Texans fighting for the Republic, you know, with, with John Wayne giving these uh, patriotic speeches, nevertheless sank deeply into the culture. And, I mean, you can see it in... You know, a lot of the, the greatest Alamo enthusiasts really date from that period. They were they were boys uh, back then. And then the third great pillar, the thing that brought the Alamo to the world, if you will, was LBJ. Um, our first, you know, uh, uh, president who uh, strongly identified as a Texan um, would 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 recite Alamo poetry uh, at state dinners. He would talk about the Alamo until listeners would literally go to sleep. He was perhaps the most famous sufferer of what some people have called Alamo fever, which is the tendency among some Texans to claim uh, an ancestor had died at the Alamo. Uh, LBJ did that uh, when some reporters came along and, uh, and corrected him. It, it's pretty clear he, he preferred the legend to the fact. Um, so by the 60s, um, after uh, Disney, after John Wayne and after LBJ, the Alamo had really become for the first time um, an icon beyond the borders of Texas. Uh, it had become, it was already becoming kind of a symbol of resolution, uh, America, especially American revolution, American uh, uh, military resolution. Um, the idea that you had to, you know, if you were fighting for your values and fighting, you fought to the death. Um, and in time, I think through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the 21st century, that has slowly morphed into a symbol 
uh, more often embraced by conservatives uh, than those who uh, identify otherwise, um, in part because conservatives find themselves um, in their minds uh, often uh, under an onslaught of um, uh, ideas that are foreign to them. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, we've been grouped in with that type of change here as, as you know, as you know, as we've, we've kind of had a, I guess I would say a substantial pushback from Alamo traditionalists here in Texas, including our Lieutenant Governor. I, yeah, I, I'm interested in what reception the book has gotten. And also, we've got about three minutes left. Brian Burrow, uh, British rock star Phil Collins, I think, has outdone LBJ in that he himself died at the Alamo. I'm, I'm curious what the what the historical record has to say about that. What role Phil Collins played? Did he surrender? Where was he positioned, et cetera? We, uh, the reception of the book has been incredibly generous. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we thought... It was pretty much just going to be kind of a little Texas regional thing, and it's gotten an awful lot of attention on the, on the coast, especially after the lieutenant governor uh, uh, canceled one of, uh, uh, effectively canceled one of our speaking events, which has become made us kind of uh, a cause celeb for First Amendment people, which I'm not entirely comfortable with. Uh, and you're right. Uh, today, probably the most famous Alamo head, if you will, is the singer and former Genesis drummer Phil Collins, who uh, owns the largest. Uh, collection of Alamo memorabilia, and not to get too far out on this tangent as we wrap up, um, he has uh, gifted it uh, or loaned it to the state of Texas as the centerpiece for a new um, uh, uh, museum planned for the Alamo. And the final chapter in our book raises a small problem with that collection in that we suggest that um, it's not all that it's cracked up to be, that a lot of it has very little provenance, and some of it, some of the items appear to be fakes. You know, I've been to San Antonio. I think the city's motto is something like U.S. military city or something. And, and I've spoken at schools there on the on the topic of war propaganda and abolishing war and, and eliminating militaries. And, of course, they generally thought I was crazy uh, and that we really needed wars. And, and I wonder what lessons, if any, you draw from debunking the particular propaganda of a particular atrocity in a particular war to the fact that there don't seem to be any wars that aren't made up entirely of, of similar uh, propaganda. Well, you're right in that every, uh, you know, every, every side in every war has a narrative. The other side calls that propaganda. Uh, I think what's, what's striking about um, the events in Texas, both back then and now, is how that propaganda was enshrined as fact, how it is – uh, accepted today, 100 years later, um, 180 years later, as what happened. And it's not what happened. The historical record simply does not support the, the facts of this legend. And so I think in, in the end, what you've seen in Texas is a kind of a, a, a bit of calcified uh, propaganda. And you just have to marvel how it has survived for going on 200 years. It seems to do that. Uh, we've been speaking with Brian Burrow. His wonderful uh, new book with his co-authors is called Forget the Alamo. I recommend you get out uh, and buy it and read it and remember it. Uh, Brian Burrow, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks so much. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.